I just want to learn from you some tips, theoretical. And then we sat and we, and we were chatting together. So don't hesitate to learn from anybody, whether he's senior or junior. Patient selection and transition. This is an approach where mechanical energy is emphasized and ultrasound is minimized. That's why your patient next day is happy compared to other techniques. It is an, the ultimate in FACO chop is using all mechanical forces by mashing the lens particles into the FACO tip, activating the non-dominant hand. And this is one of the most difficult thing in this technique. So if I am a right-handed surgeon, this hand should be dominant. With time, you will learn how to make this non-dominant hand a, a dominant hand. Very effective in all of cases. Actually, I, I do fake a job for the last 10 years. It is the best technique in every case, but very effective in hard cataract and in complicated cases like zonal adhesions. Why should we learn fake a job? Because it is less fake time, less fake power, and hence less endothelial damage, less stress in the zonules and the capsule. Fake tip is working in the central part of the pupil, and it is kinesthetic technique or reflex with less reliance on visualization of the fake tip. So you are your hand is percepting the, the the capsular bag. You know the anatomically, and we will talk about it. Your hand sometimes is moving behind the pupil, and you don't see it by your eyes. Some history. Uh, divide and conquer. I, I like to attribute for those guys who work in history, so just to attribute to them. Gimbel from Calgary, he described the divide and conquer in 1980s, where he uses about 100% sculpting. And <coughs> Bolkoch, he described the stop and chop, and he, he make it less about 50% sculpting. This is, I personally call it double stop and chop, and this is single stop and chop. And the chop technique where there is zero sculpting has been described, first horizontal chopping and then vertical chopping. The first man who developed uh, the, or described the horizontal chop is Nagahara in 1993, and he won the film festival with his technique. And he proved that it reduces the zonular stress, increases the surgical efficiency, and it is ideal for advanced and mature cataract. And experienced surgeons, with time, they migrated to fake chop technique. And I was asking David Chang, who's, who's an international figure in fake chop, last two years ago. And he said, because he's, he's an editor in the GCRS, he said about 25% to 30% have converted from the ACRS members from stop and chop and uh, divide and conquer, they converted to the FECO chop technique. And when you go really now to the ACRS, you find the, the international figures, they are not doing stop and chop. Although I personally cons consider stop and chop is, is one of the good technique in the good hands. We are, we are now talking about intermediate surgeons or surgeons learning. Howard Gimbel, his technique is, 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 is divine and conquer, and he's getting good results. But we are teaching people. David Chang, he named it non-stop chop, which means chopping right away without making crater. So it is chopping technique that eliminate all sculpting. Two main variations, the classic Nagahara, which has been described in 1993, and the vertical chopping, I, uh, this is by Fakasaku in ACRS in 1995. He called it FECO snap and split. And then FECO crack by Valdemir Bivier in 1996. And then David Dillman, he approached the FECO quick chop for uh, vertical chopping for these hard cataract. Strategies for FECO chop start with, is, is like the regular FECO. Start with easy cases. Normal axial length, avoid the extremes. Clear cornea, deep anterior chamber, well dilated pupil, good red reflex, 
one to two necrosclerosis, good hydrodissection, hydrodelineation, <coughs> and 30 degree FACO tip. Some studies about FACO chop, uh, Stephen Dewey, this is one of the ACRS members. Uh, he compared two techniques and he found FACO chop is, is more significantly better than the stop and chop and delivering less energy to the corneal endothelium. Another study in the GSCRS also compared. But we did, we did a large study in our university that was uh, two years ago, and I presented this in the ACRS verbal talk in Boston. Uh, and it is comparing FACO chop versus stop and chop, comparative analysis of FACO parameters and visual acuity. So we took 84 consecutive cases of FACO chop, group one, and 63 uh, of co stop and chop, group two. And the variables were pre op visual acuity, central corneal thickness, degree of sclerosis, axial length, AC depth, effective FACO time, ultrasound time. Percentage FACO power, centra, uh, corneal edema, VA, one day, one week, one month. And the result, we, the, the conclusion was the FACO chop technique is safer to the corneal endothelium as less ultrasound energy was used. I will show you the result here. The parameters, the group one is the FACO chop. The group two is the stop and chop. And EFX, uh, if you see here, in the immature cases was 11.49 in the FACO chop, and here it was 42. And the mature cases, it was 46, and see how, la how big in the mature stop and chop. And this is a uh, B value is significant in both. So this is the power. And the effective FACO time is again 0 0.2 to 0.3. And here 1.6 to 21. Again, it is very significant. The percentage FACO power, again, is very significant. And th th there is no question the FACO power is, 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 is significantly less, whether mature or immature. But when we went to the visual acuity, although the FACO power was significantly less, but we found in the immature cases, it was 0.1. So if you are a stop and chop surgeon and you're you're uh, doing stop and chop, the visual acuity is as comparable as the FACO chop. But when we went to the mature cases, 0.36, and here it is 0.15, so it was very significant. The stop and chop, see, it is less, uh, the vision is less, so it means more corneal edema. Even that was persistent in the first week, and also in one month. These are when you get plus four, plus five in nuclear sclerosis. So the strategies for converting to, uh, for converting to a stop and chop, if you are doing uh, divine and conical, do your first, this is just to summarize this, do your first crater and the second crater try to make it as chopping. Because when you do the first crater, you are creating space to pull one piece and then avoid doing the another crater. If you are a stop and chop surgeon, you are making the first crater, try to practice this with the, with, under the capsule, try to practice the, the uh, chopping. I will show you some video here. See how stop and chop does put pressure on the zonules. Look, look at that. Look at the pressure. Yes, there, there is a zonular pressure, and and this is this is augmented if you are using less FACO power. When you get hard cataract, you should use high power. So if you are scavenging the lens, if you are pressing the lens, huh, you are going creating more pressure. And that was that was proved in Miyake view. See in Miyake view, the stop and chop is putting pressure in the zonules. Because you are pressing, you are pressing all the time.
see the FACO chop is not putting pressure, is moving the parts. This is uh, the first crater. See, the bad thing about stop and chop, you have to have a good dilated pupil, which sometimes they don't need in, in FACO chop because you are coming from one direction to the other direction of the capsular axis. And more ultrasound. Putting pressure, see, in the zone yields. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Ma'an to present his, uh, his, his difficult lecture, which is FACO Dynamics. Thank you very much, Dr. German. So <clears throat> my part will be the most uh, boring and difficult part. I, so I hope I can still um, gain your attention. I'll be talking about the FACO Dynamics. Um, Let's start very simply by mentioning that the FACO tip has a standard tip size of an outer diameter of 1.1 millimeter and an inner diameter of 0 0.9 uh, millimeters. Uh, th these dimensions are very important to keep in mind because when you impale, as you will see in the coming slides, one should not be so afraid. The, the FACO tip is not, so, it's not, it's not so wide. And we know that the thickness of the cataractus lens is at least 3.5 millimeters. So you're less than a third of the thickness of the cataractus lens. The um, uh, newer um, uh, faker tip designs have an outer diameter of 0.8, so that's even smaller than the inner diameter of the previous versions, and an inner diameter of 0.6 millimeters. So because of this narrower diameter, there's less uh, holding power for the same settings, and that's why companies came up with uh, new settings in order to increase the capacity and uh, the ability of these narrower tips. So they have less amount of material uh, um, removed over time um, unless we change the settings. In regards to the foot pedal, very simply, uh, step one is irrigation, step two is irrigation and aspiration, and step three is uh, the last two plus ultrasound energy. Uh, and these are the four important uh, parameters every um, faker surgeon should keep in mind. The aspiration flow, the vacuum, the ultrasound energy, as Dr. Germain mentioned, that we need to uh, uh, consume uh, as less as we can, and the bottle height, which is very important in uh, maintaining a deep anterior chamber and preventing a surge, which is sudden collapse of the anterior chamber. So the fake handpiece um, basically looks like this. There's this ultrasound uh, energy cable that provides energy to this uh, FACO handpiece. Uh, activated, um, the, uh, stro the FACO tip begins to uh, stroke uh, in a forward and backward direction. There's an irrigation line that passes through um, BSS, balanced salt solution, and 80% of that comes out from the um, uh, irrigation side ports and some around the FACO tip. So consumed material go through this uh, FACO tip and then out from the uh, aspiration line. The power is an interaction between stroke and frequency. And frequency uh, of the uh, speed of the needle is uh, somewhere between 35,000 uh, hertz and 45,000 hertz. The longer the stroke length, the more it moves forward, the greater the impact is on the nucleus. Um, let's look at these three parameters separately, flow rate, vacuum, and power. Um, with an 18 cc per minute flow rate, the materials move um, quite slowly towards the tip. If we increase, um, to, uh, if we increase th that setting to 30 cc's, then you'll find that the attraction becomes much faster. And for this, you need a more experienced surgeon. Vacuum, uh, a vacuum that has 60 millimeters mercury has reasonable holdability. But once we increase to 400 millimeters of mercury, then that holdability <laughs> becomes quite strong and quite firm. And that's usually the type of vacuums that we use in FACO chop. 
in regards to um, power, a 30 uh, US energy power has a forward uh, movement of around 30%, forward and backward movement of 30%. If that power is increased to 50, then the, the uh, um, FACO tip moves 50% forward and backward, 50% of its maximum forward and backward movement. So when we talk about flow rate, we talk about speed of attraction. Vacuum means holdability, and power means uh, fragmentation. Um, again, um, flow attracts, uh, vacuum holds, and power consumes. The frequency is in, in any machine is fixed and unchanged. The st uh, stroke length is predetermined by the surgeon um, preoperatively, so you can predetermine, you can even have different levels, cataract grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, and you can um, uh, predetermine the <laughs> amount of ultrasound that you would like to, for, for each mode. Um, stroke length can be gradually increased intraoperatively by something called phaco pedal in linear mode. So in linear mode, as you press further down the pedal, you increase the amount of energy given. So let's talk about FACO mode in more details. The basic modulation means we have three different types. We have a continuous mode where ultrasound is continuously being applied inside the eye. A pulse mode, which we'll talk more in detail in the coming slides, where pulses are given on and off. And we have a burst mode in which um, right from the start, maximum energy is given from uh, as soon as you press down to, uh, to uh, foot position three. Okay, uh, this is uh, a better uh, um, uh, picture of what I meant when we talk about a continuous mode. So in, as you can see here, in four seconds, we have a continuous energy being applied. In the pulse mode, uh, for every second, uh, you have on, off, on, off. So um, you can also um, pre-fix uh, um, the amount of pulses that you want per second. As you can see here, in this um, uh, uh, two pulse per second mode, you have two pulses in one complete second, but what the machine does, it divides a one second into four milliseconds. So you have a, a quarter of a second with the energy on, a quarter of the second with the energy off, and then another quarter on, another quarter off. So this leaves you with two pulses per second. And the same applies for four pulses per second and 10 pulses per second. I'm explaining what I said in more details and, and numbers. So as you can see here, um, in all three parameters, we have the ultrasound 50% on and off. But what has changed is the frequency of the pulses. Obviously, 10 pulses per second, uh, we still do have 50 on and off, but we have more off intervals, and thus there's less heat accumulation inside the eye, and this has been proven by um, uh, infrared cameras. So in the pulse mode, pulses of energy are delivered at a defined rate of pulses per second, which is the number of cycles per second. As you can see here, um, in the panel mode and the <coughs> surgical mode, in the panel mode, um, there is no increase in ultrasound. Once you press to foot pedal three, you get the maximum amount of ultrasound, whereas in the surgical mode, it gives you this linear increase in uh, ultrasound. So this is called the fixed mode and this is called the linear mode. So again, this can make uh, our delivery of the energy inside the eye more sophisticated. So by, uh, by having the pulse mode where you have a rather um, cool uh, type of FACO, now you can also increase the ultrasound by the uh, linear mode from starting from a low level and then reaching maximum once you, once you feel that the uh, piece needs further energy. In the burst mode, what happens is, once you press in uh, foot pedal three, you get the maximum ultrasound that was predetermined, but as you further press down, the interval, the off intervals become less and less until you, until you end up with a continuous mode. And this is the basic difference between continuous uh, uh, ultrasound, pulsed linear ultrasound, and a burst linear uh, ultrasound energy. 
Of course, the uh, uh, latter two, pulse and burst, are considered to be much cooler than the first. As I mentioned earlier, because the FACO tip roughly has a, a diameter of one millimeter, and the cataractus lens is, um, has 3.5 millimeters, which is approximately around three times, if not even more, the width of a FACO tip, it's relatively safe to impale and dip down the FACO into the core of the nucleus, or even perform a crater here before attempting a crack. As Dr. German mentioned, we have the, pre uh, the uh, previous uh, techniques, earlier techniques of four by four divided conquer where two grooves are, are, are performed, are, are, as he mentioned it, uh, two uh, stop and chop. And we have the single linear groove where 90% is reached and then a, a crack is attempted. And for this, we use either continuous or pulsed ultrasound. And as he mentioned beautifully in his study, that um, more energy um, is scientifically evident, is delivered inside the eye. And thus, this is a much hotter type of FACO uh, uh, technique. Um, in uh, uh, horizontal, vertical, or even back chopping technique, we use the burst mode. And uh, as you can see in these two um, figures here, um, we impale, uh, and then we um, uh, move the uh, second instrument towards the FACO tip, and then initiate a crack that um, propagates down to the end of the to the posterior surface of the cataract. In the, vert in the vertical chopping technique, we uh, again impale, but we use a sharp second instrument, but we don't have this horizontal movement. And for these two techniques, we use the burst mode. As he mentioned, it reduces the heat uh, um, uh, given at the needle. It allows for good purchasing. Burst mode gives you maximum energy, high vacuum, so it immediately holds the, the uh, nucleus right at its stiffest area, uh, which is uh, sometimes better described as the sweet spot, while maintaining this holdability on position two on high vacuum. So um, this explains how we perform this procedure. We impale, and then a horizontal movement uh, is performed towards the phaco tip and then the, uh, the two hemi uh, 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 nuclei are separated. Of course, performing this technique, one should, be, um, should, be, should pay full attention that his second instrument is beneath the anterior capsule and not on top. Otherwise, serious complications can occur. So once you've um, uh, cracked it into uh, two pieces, you can further crack uh, the cataract extends into smaller pieces. Cracking them further into smaller pieces makes consumption of these uh, pieces much easier for the faker tip to consume. In the ver uh, vertical uh, uh, chopping technique, um, a blunt instrument is um, uh, rarely used. We use a sharper instrument, and this makes cracking much easier. Again, we impale. And then the tip is placed just um, anterior to the uh, FACO tip. And this propagates the, um, the sharpness of the second instrument with the holdability of the FACO, uh, FACO handpiece, propagates the uh, crack back uh, posteriorly. Uh, the beauty of this technique, it can be used in small pupils. And this is a side view of the technique. There's also something called the back chopping technique. In the back chopping technique, you really don't need much um, ultrasound or holdability here, uh, or you, don't, you sometimes don't even need to impale. Because what you're doing is you're crushing the nucleus between the second instrument and the phaco tip. And this um, uh, is quite safe, but needs further training and the second instrument should have a blunt tip. Let me show you some videos of these different techniques. We'll start with the back chopping technique. As you can see, you see the, the phaco tip here is blunt. So you go all the way back, you elevate the nucleus with your second uh, instrument, and then you crush the nucleus in between the, the, two instru uh, the second instrument and the phaco tip. So you're, you're, you're basically lifting the nucleus uh, superiorly and then crushing it against 
the faker tip. You're not using the power really here. The, so, th so this is even cooler than the vertical and horizontal chop. Uh, this is the um, horizontal chopping technique. Let me fast forward this for, if I can. No, I can't. Okay, anyway. In the horizontal technique, um, we need to be, we, we have to make sure that we are uh, beneath the anterior capsule so as not to rupture uh, the anterior capsule and cause an extension. And this comes uh, with time. You can sometimes even use horizontal techniques with small pupils. Sometimes you, you begin to just blindly feel your way uh, towards the equator of the nucleus and um, perform a horizontal chop. So I'm just cleaning the cortex here, exposing the, the nucleus. And then now I will start impaling right down into the core and then moving the second instrument horizontally. And you see how this propagates down posteriorly. And now I can further crack into smaller, spot, uh, smaller uh, uh, pieces, making it much easier for the phaco tip to consume smaller pieces. In regards to a, um, you see this, this is a, a, a much um, harder cataract. And this here, um, it was opted to perform a crater, <coughs> to perform a crater in the nucleus so that propagating the crack uh, posteriorly can become much easier. Because this um, strong, stiff, leathery nucleus can sometimes um, prevent the crack from reaching down further posteriorly. So performing a crater and then performing the horizontal or, or, or vertical shop can sometimes make the procedure easier. Cortical aspiration is um, uh, a much simpler uh, step of the procedure where the cortex is aspirated and dragged towards the center. As you can see here, the aspiration is usually performed at the center and not at the periphery. So as to prevent any um, possibility of aspirating the capsule. And finally, the IOL implantation which is uh, the, probably one of the easiest steps of the procedure. And thank you.